time for deal or no deal. I signed for them after the Euros and after my first day's training on a diving home, I was actually thinking, regretting it, what have I done? I like I walked into a circus. It's amazing, isn't it? Phil Egan, good morning to you. Sure, how are you doing? Uh, Shane on YouTube, straight off the bat, says, where are OTB with Manchester United now? Are they still calling Ole clueless, Pogba underperforming, etc.? Manchester United are back, Phil. They're back. Have they won the league yet? I mean, it's yeah. like they're, they're, they're co-leaders. They're co-leaders. They're joint top, apparently, which um, I remember back in 2012 when Aguero scored that famous goal. The two teams finished top of the on the same amount of points, but City were awarded the title, so I'm not really sure how the, the joint top thing goes. But look, United are in an unbelievable position at the moment because you think back to around this time last year, roll on a few weeks, they were beaten at Anfield, then they lost to Burnley at Old Trafford, and it looked like Solskjaer was in serious trouble. And one thing they've had a knack of being able to do under Solskjaer is pull out results. It's not, the players have never down tools for Solskjaer. Sometimes they just haven't been good enough, but obviously Bruno Fernandes has changed everything. That Those two results I talked about last season, the Liverpool and Burnley games, they were without Bruno Fernandes. At the time when Bruno Fernandes was joining, I mean, he could have been forgiven for thinking, what have I got myself into? But since then, United have gone on to be a much better team. The biggest surprise probably last season was that they didn't maybe get a bit of silverware because they got themselves into the three semi-finals, but they, they couldn't get over the line. So it, it's still very early days, but the signs were a lot better in the Villa game. The Wolves game, you're starting to see some of the old failings where they couldn't break a team down, but they actually played a lot better against Villa and Pogba in particular, but the Cynics would say Pogba was playing for a move. Well, that's actually uh, part of my deal or no deal script here. Uh, Manchester United look likely to sell Pogba in the summer window. We will monitor that situation, like the Skibbereen Eagle. The Mirror report that their top brass reckon they dodged a bullet by refusing to break the bank to land Jaden Sancho. Old Trafford insiders uh, say Solskjaer much keener on his British Dortmund teammate Erling Haaland. I mean, you know, uh, that's obviously. Uh, hey, 33 goals in his last 32 games for Dortmund. Barca and Real Madrid also in the mix. Could he be on his way to Manchester United? I think whoever gets him, he transforms the team straight away. He's an absolute machine in terms of goals. And you wonder where he wants to go because it's it's really up to him. Everyone wants him. I mean, he could. I'm sure if you said to Pep Guardiola, would you like Erling Haaland in your team? Of course. And Erling Haaland's father obviously played for Manchester City. Um, he's talked about wanting to play for Leeds. I think that's obviously dream fantasy stuff as much as we'd love to see it. But it's whether Real Madrid or Barcelona can come up with the cash and can they show Erling Haaland that if, if he joins them, that this is the best move for him. But certainly United are in a better position now than they would have been this time last year to get somebody like Erling Haaland. But going back to the Sancho thing, he's only 20. I know he scored his first Bundesliga goal of the season yesterday, also missed an absolute sitter. But all the talk and speculation of his future is bound to have affected him. He's also a player, an English player that's abroad, maybe thought, I'm going to get to come home. Hasn't happened. He's still at a great club. But I, I don't think you'd be saying that uh, United have dodged a bullet because I'm pretty sure if he went into the United squad, he would have made a, a hell of a difference. Is there a possibility, though, that actually he might have been another slow burner into that Manchester United squad that actually would, <clears throat> would take him a year or two and that at that price, <clears throat> Manchester United fans' expectation would be that he should be straight in the team straight away. Like, if you look at how... Van de Beek is, um, he, four weeks ago, before Manchester United went on this run, was like this massively important, um, uh, it was almost like a, a Rorschach test for whether or not you thought the club was being managed well, was how they were buying this player who was essentially a replacement, it turns out, for Pogba. Uh, but he's not getting game time at the moment. Solskjaer doesn't know what's happening. It's a transfer committee or somebody is deciding on these players. What the hell is going on? With Sancho, there might have been a, a, a case where he wasn't starting every game, where he's only 20 and he's got to get to grips with being one of the most expensive footballers in world history. Um, maybe the right thing for them to do was not to sign him last season. Yeah, like I, I think obviously the money was massive, given everything that's gone on in the last year in terms of 
the economy as well. But United couldn't justify paying that amount of money. But the, I think the difference with Sancho and Van der Beek is Sancho, you can see him in the United system and how he would work because United are at their best when they're counter-attacking and with pace. And, and that's exactly what Sancho is all about. He has that pace. Whereas Van der Beek, the best we've seen of him in the Ajax team is a team that plays a certain system, possession, football, dominate games possession-wise. And, you know, the, the glimpses we've seen of him, he's very neat and tidy on the ball, doesn't take too much out of it. And he's just one of these players that keeps things moving along nicely. But you don't always need to be able to do that with the United team. You look at, we mentioned Pogba, Pogba the other night against Villa, found himself in deep positions, but he had that ball where he could play a killer pass. And mm. Van de Beek, is, as I said, he, he's more of a player that if you had a certain system, he would uh, he'd fit into that. Now, maybe that's something that could happen in the future. But it's funny how United are obviously doing so well now. There's less and less talk of Donny Van de Beek. Exactly, yeah. That's the whole this point. That's what happens, yeah. Uh, and, right. And that, like, Go on. Is, is there kind of like a similar situation to maybe Navi Keita in his first season at Liverpool, where there wasn't, again, the, the similar level of talk that you had with Van de Beek this season, but the key difference being that Liverpool were winning and they were having an unbelievable season and there was this brilliant player who wasn't maybe getting into that starting midfield? Yeah, I, I mean, there was so much hope for Navi Keita when he arrived and obviously he was, he was in and out of the team and... Klopp said he just has to get used to it, but also what we've seen since then, what's transpired is that he's just not able for it physically at the moment. That um, I think a lot of Liverpool fans are actually almost at the stage where if he picks up another few injuries between now and the end of the season, they start questioning whether he has a future at the club, which seems a, a, a long way, a far cry from what was the case when they signed him. There was such, such excitement that Liverpool had gotten advocated, but keeps breaking down, he keeps picking up little injuries, but he's just not getting a run on the team. Um, and yeah, if you, once you're winning, these things don't become an issue, but obviously Liverpool are not winning as much this season. So when Keita gets injured, like he has done a few times already this season, then it just frustrates fans even more. And say with Van der Beek, you know, there's a lot of games between now and the end of the season. So he could still have a role to play. And United obviously, are still in the Europa League, and I, I would imagine Solskjaer would be looking at players like Van der Beek to, to start games in the Europa League. Let's move on to Chelsea. Obviously, they invested significantly in upgrading their squad. Is it time to significantly upgrade their manager as well? The Athletic report that uh, Frank Lampard's job is under serious threat. They also report there is tension between Lampard and a number of individuals in his squad, who I'm sure have responded very well to being called out repeatedly in the aftermath of every game. Uh, some of the possible replacements. Massimiliano Allegri, Thomas Tuchel, Laurent Blanc, Rafa Benitez, Nuno Espirito Santo. Uh, Mark Shields on YouTube says Nagelsmann. And uh, obviously, we've had Brendan Rodgers suggested here as well. Has Lampard done enough to get sacked? Um, he's probably got a little bit more time. If you just look at the, the fixtures, obviously, this weekend, they've got FA Cup and they're playing League Two Morecambe. So you'd imagine they win that. It's a home game as well. And then they fall them away on Friday week. A very winnable game. Then looking at their next few games, they've Leicester away, Wolves at home, Burnley at home, and then Spurs away in early February. Now, if they can string a few wins together in those games, then you know he gets more time. But looking at those games, Leicester away, at the moment you wouldn't fancy Chelsea to win that. Wolves at home, you know Wolves have already beaten them. Season the best we see of Wolves is when they play the bigger teams and they can, they can counter attack. Burnley at home. Is a game you'd expect them to win, but then Spurs away, Jose Mourinho at White Hart Lane. You know, football is a funny way of playing out. Maybe that's the game where things are not going well. Lampard loses away to Spurs, and then Roman Abramovich decides, right, Frank, you're a club legend, but this just isn't working out at the moment. And the signs haven't been good in the last few weeks. The Arsenal performance in particular, um, you know, other defeats like the Everton game, the Wolves game, there were games that Chelsea could have won. Abramovich doesn't do excuses and yeah, he keeps, you know, he's not shy Lampard and having a go with the players and professional footballers don't particularly like that. Lampard should know this given that he played in several Chelsea teams that down tools effectively and got rid of managers. And as soon as they brought in a new manager, all of a sudden things were rosy again. So 
Yeah, it, it doesn't look good from, but I'd be surprised if they pull the trigger between now and that FA Cup tie against Morecambe. And if they beat Morecambe, I can't imagine that they're going to sack him. So, but they're in that precarious position now where if they lose games, that after every game, you know, questions will be asked. And it was just the manner of the defeat yesterday. I don't even know if Manchester City are as good as they looked yesterday. I think Chelsea were just shambolic in that first half. It's like they'd never watched City play and De Bruyne caused some serious issues because he just kept drifting out of that, that attack and Zuma and Thiago Silva didn't know what to do with him. City are pretty good, I think. No? Yeah. No, they're definitely d different. And, and look, there's a reason that Liverpool and City aren't as far out as the, the other teams this season because they can't press in the way that they have been because there was no pre-season, well, effectively no pre-season. Teams are not using as much energy in games. They just don't have it at the moment. But City have kind of tweaked things. They're, they're a bit more conservative. They hold on to the ball, a bit more low risk. And that's why somebody like John Stones is now gaining in confidence because he's not being exposed left two on two or in one on one situations. He's got Ruben Diaz beside him, but they've also got a bit more shape about them. Yeah, so it'll be very interesting to see how they evolve. Who should the next Chelsea boss be? Do you, sorry, I mean, you don't think he's going to be sacked immediately if they win the, the Morecambe game. He might be sacked in the next 24 hours. That would be the kind of key danger moment. Then they'll have to get ready for the uh, game at the weekend, so they won't do that. And then they'll win that and they could go on a run. But at the end of the season, if they finish sixth, who's the next Chelsea boss? That list you mentioned there, like the two that would stand out would be Allegri and Tuchel. And if I was picking one of them, I'd go with Allegri. Like Chelsea have all these attacking players at the moment, but they just don't look right at the back. Silva's 36. Zuma isn't really the answer. Now he's he's been okay at times this season. He's obviously contributed at the other end as well by scoring goals. And even Mendy was brought in and started well, but even he looks like he's lost a bit of confidence as well. So uh, Chilwell actually has settled in quite well. Reese James, as good as he is going forward, is still got a lot to learn. And I, I think it was noticeable yesterday with Aspel Laqueda that his legs are they're not there anymore where there was times he got into attacking positions, but he just couldn't drive on the way somebody like Reese James could do. But if you get a, a manager that can set them up defensively, they have so much attacking talent, but they're trying to knit it all together and what's the best system. That that front three started yesterday is the front three I pretty much thought he'd go with from the start of the season, but it hasn't worked out because of injuries. But I thought he'd go Werner in the middle and then obviously Pulisic on the left and CH on the right. But Werner just doesn't look like he's got any confidence at all. And I'd say a lot of Liverpool fans are quite happy that they didn't fork out 50 million. But then again, if he had gone to Liverpool, would he be going through this confidence crisis? I don't think so. I mean, maybe it's the perfect scenario where they get to buy him on the cheap in 18 months' time and he comes and uh, re rediscovers his confidence. Uh, yeah. According to the Independent, uh, the London Independent, Spurs have begun the process of negotiating with Harry Kane to extend his deal. His current contract runs until 2024, and I think we all remember it was like some ridiculously cheap deal. Uh, this comes amid expected interest from Manchester City and PSG, who see him as a potential Mbappe replacement if he moves during the summer. Are Spurs big enough to keep Harry Kane? Yeah, I think so. I think so. I think Harry Kane now obviously scored again at the weekend. 205 goals. He'll be 28 this summer. He's got his eye on that Jimmy Gray's record, which is 266. He's obviously just a few goals behind Bobby Smith. So he'll, he'll go to second in that all-time leading scorer list in the next few weeks, you'd imagine. And... Um, all that's missing for, for Harry Kane now is a bit of silverware. They have a good chance in the League Cup, obviously. They'll fancy their chances against Brentford and then they play one of the Manchester clubs in the final. Mourinho will be thinking, yeah, there's uh, there's two teams we've already beaten this season. We just stick to the sit-in, playing the counter-attack, and we have a League Cup now. Just a League Cup, but Mourinho has always kind of won that League Cup and then built on it now. I don't think Spurs are going to win the league. Maybe the Europa League is something, but I, I don't know. I, 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 I could see him looking at their rivals in the in the Premier League, those those top teams. Which of those teams does Harry Kane get into? Uh, does he? Uh, Manchester City. Yeah. Manchester United. 
And I think probably Liverpool. Well, if, I'm not sure. If, for me, no, obviously fulfills that specific role that Liverpool want from their nine. I, I think Philly gets into two of the three, doesn't he? Yeah, but I think what we've seen, obviously, with Kane in the last few months and even last season as well, obviously, you know, his injury record would suggest that there's, there's more to come. But he links so well with Son and he plays in that withdrawn role at times as well. So is he now not becoming a more realistic option as a number nine because he doesn't really play that role as much anymore? Where, he okay, he gets himself into the box, but he gets no problem dropping deep. And maybe that's just because that's the way Mourinho's playing, that they do sit deep at times and Harry Kane can just come in and add another body into midfield. But if he's going to be 28 in the summer, are Manchester City going to, like, think of about how much money they'd have to fork out well, to how much, Harry Kane. How much? Well, he's the England captain. So England players, there's obviously a tax on that. So you're looking at at least 100 million. Are Manchester City going to spend 100 million on Harry Kane when we just mentioned someone like Erling Haaland who they'd obviously have to pay more for, but the age profile means you're probably going to get a hell of a better deal in the long term out of someone like Erling Haaland. How much is Erling Haaland? Say you're looking the, the way things are going now, he's looking at 150 million. Yeah, and Kylian Mbappe, Kylian Mbappe. See, the problem for PSG at the moment is his contract is running down, and he's actually, he, I'm not saying he's he's on the wane or anything, but he's he's not been in as good form as he as he was, say, a couple of seasons ago. So maybe he'd be kind of in between that Kane and Mbappe or at the Kane and Haaland figure, maybe. But you'd imagine if Pochettino took that job, he's been told, look, Mbappe and Neymar are going nowhere. Right. Uh, the, the last bit of this um, was that Pochettino apparently also wants to bring Hugo Lloris and Deli Ali to Paris. Will either player join him, do you think? Yeah, I could definitely see Hugo Lloris joining. Um, Deli Ali, not so sure. But Hugo Lloris, again, his contract is, is running down. A, a French World Cup winner time to go home maybe and why not go to PSG the French champions and play for a manager that you know so well yeah and I can see Dali Ali going for next to nothing it's a shot to nothing for him it's a chance to get his career back on track um, fairly uh, low risk for all of them AS in Spain report that Liverpool are back channeling in an attempt to hijack Kylian Mbappe's potential move to Real Madrid uh, while obviously Madrid are still the expected destination the paper reports that the Premier League club have moved in recent weeks to persuade Mbappe's entourage to bring the star to Anfield. On a scale of 1 to 10, how likely are Liverpool to sign Kylian Mbappe? I'm going to go lowball it here and say maybe 1 or 2. Just don't, I, don't, I don't see it happening. Like the, the front three, obviously, we wondered what would Liverpool do when this front three breaks up. They obviously brought in Jota and he's injured at the moment, but he's made a huge difference. So, you know, that... You mentioned Real Madrid. There is still a lot of talk about Mo Salah and mm. that that interview that he did in Spain. Where are they trying to get their get their man a move, like his his representatives? But again, Salah will cost huge money, and you know he's he's hitting the thirty mark soon enough. Where would Real Madrid be forking out more than a hundred million for a player that's? Going to be hitting 30 soon enough. Well, do you sell him if you're Liverpool? That's the other side. Do you feel like you can swap out Salah for Mbappe for no money and get a player who might be as effective in the Premier League but who is much younger? But I think the encouraging thing for Liverpool is the fact that Jota has come in and shown that there is life after the, the front three. If the front three isn't playing, that they can cope without them. So and Liverpool have shown in the past that if players want to leave, they're not going to stand in the way because they don't want players who don't want to play for the club. But I don't know. Like every time you watch Salah play, you can't fault the uh, the effort and you know that that drive he has to win. So I, I find it a strange situation where people are even talking about Salah not being a Liverpool player because from what you see from him on the pitch, there's no sign he of loves, it. He loves playing for Liverpool and he wants to win more titles and and they're going to pay. Him. Absolutely, and Liverpool are in a position where they're challenging for the Premier League. They're still, I think, a lot of people's favourites to win the league title, and they're in the last 16 of the Champions League. And Real Madrid at the moment are a little bit off winning La Liga. Atletico obviously have 
a, a slight lead over them, but they have a few games in hand as well. I've got uh, two quick ones for you to wrap up on this. Graham Hunter issued a stay away warning to uh, any eight, any uh, football clubs out there watching OTBM this morning about Diego Costa. He thinks he's done essentially as a top player. Arsenal and Wolves are apparently leading the Premier League links with him. Should either sign him? No, absolutely not. I'd agree with Graham. Like he's 15 injuries since he went back to Atletico Madrid. The best days are behind him, and I know he did, he had a problem with his back, and it's affected even how he's jumping for the ball. So he's just not the same player. And Arsenal have been through a, a sticky patch, but don't go and ruin it all by signing someone like Diego Costa. They've been slated for signing somebody like Willian. Stick with the young players because you know they're the future of the club. And Costa going in there. He's going to cost a fortune, and how much are you going to get out of him? Do Liverpool need a centre-back? Uh, I think so, yeah. Funny, obviously, Fabinho's been exceptional. Could end up being in the PFA team of the year as a centre-back, even though he's not a centre-back. But, you know, you're looking at even tonight's game, they're away from home. The recent um, suggestions would be that Nat Phillips starts, because he seems to be playing Phillips in the away games, Reese Williams in the home games. But you know, Matip obviously keeps getting injured. He's, Klopp has said like they, they won't necessarily look to strengthen at the back if the option isn't there. But you know, he says this before. He he doesn't want to be talking about bringing yeah. in new players because you know he doesn't want it to affect the likes of Reese Williams or Nat Phillips. But um, I think even before the season, they were a little bit short there because obviously Lovren left. They were banking on using Fabinho as centre half, but they didn't bank on losing Van Dijk and Gomez. In the so space of a few on weeks. the balance of probability, on a scale of zero to hundred, what percentage chance do you think they will actually purchase a centre back in the next three weeks? I'd be very surprised if they didn't. Uh, like I think they'd be maybe looking at a, a a young player that it's somebody that they'll have for for the future, but that they'll be able to put in soon enough as well and play beside Fabinho and Good stuff. obviously Matt Matt will will come back in as well. Phil, good stuff. That's this week's, that's today's Deal or No Deal.